So my name is Soledad Gutierrez and I'm curator at TVA21 and also curator at On Stage. And we are here today as part of the stage conversation series and we are with Daniel Stigman Mangrane that he's presenting a new piece produced for stage that it's also available or could be visited on the Museo Nacional de Semborna y Misa in Madrid as part of the exhibition How to Thread Lately that will be open till the 17th of January. And I wanted to thank Daniel for joining this adventure that even though it's being presented at the very end of the first season of the stage, it's been an ongoing conversation since I would say almost the beginning, finding the best way to create or to present this piece we are about to discuss. So thank you very much. And without many Rounds about, I would like to start talking about the piece we have presented. The beginning of the piece actually started years ago uh, when I scanned the, uh, the rainforest, the piece of the rainforest, uh, the Mata Atlantica rainforest, which is uh, one of the, the four or five main uh, Brazilian ecosystems um, and actually one of the most biodiverse uh, ecosystems of the world that I've been, I've been interested and has been already subject of many of, of works of mine you know, since, since, well, since, since I came to live in Brazil. Um, when I scanned the, the, this, this piece of forest uh, together with ScanLab, this company in London, um, I, was, I was totally uh, obsessed with the, with the um, the, the, the physical qualities, uh, I was going to say the, the visual qualities, but they are, they are almost physical, no? because it's really three-dimensional, so it really kind of involves you. So, um, of course, once uh, this scan was done to do this uh, virtual reality piece, uh, Phantom, but, um, but once you have the, the model, the 3D model, uh, you can you can do whatever you want with it. No? You can do a movie, you can animate it, you can whatever, actually. So, so it's been for a while already that I've been having this idea of using this raw material uh, or reuse it in some other fashion. I've been reading a lot uh, about the forest uh, for the last years also about the mythologies of the rainforest and the beliefs and the cosmogonies you know, of, the, of the people that inhabit the forest, the, the traditional populations and the indigenous populations. And obviously the panther as the major uh, predator in the, in the world Americas uh, has a, a very prominent uh, space in all these mythologies and all these uh, on this, I mean, it's, it's obviously a fascinating animal. Uh, so I mean, I had my, my own uh, part of obsession with, with, with them. <laughs> yeah, so as I was saying, I was, I, I, I used this, uh, had this idea of using the, the, the environment uh, the digital environment of phantom, the digital scanning of the, of the forest for other pieces. Um, and at the time I got the, the, your invitation, uh, I was producing a, a little, uh, a small photo novel for the, um, the, the October Salon uh, in, in Belgrade, which is curated by, by Lara Marota and Andrea Bassin which is called the dreamers. Um, so I was already in, the, in this, in this uh, mindset of dreams and et cetera. The, um, for, for this photo novel, uh, that, uh, just like a few images, I, I did these drawings of this little panther uh, walking through the, through the digital forest. And, uh, and the, in the last page of the, of the, of the novel, you will find that the, that the panther is sleeping and is dreaming the, the previous pages you have seen. So, so basically, 
when you asked me to do something for the for the website of the stage, I was thinking uh, I, I had several ideas. You know, some were so simple as putting a recording or maybe a previous video, but then I thought that the the environment of the um, of the um, of the stage of the website uh, you were creating could be uh, like a little ecosystem in itself for a new life uh, to appear. You know? So then I thought that I would do the animation of this panther walking through the, through the forest and not anymore like a, just a series of drawings or, or photographs, but uh, really uh, an animation. But then it become pretty early on clear that this animation shouldn't be like a just a scripted animation that, uh, that has a beginning and an end, um, but it should be like a real life uh, animation. So basically what we did is uh, we created a, what is called a procedural animation in which uh, there's a little uh, artificial intelligence uh, that is the panther that decides at any given moment what to do or where to go and, and whatever. So basically, it's very important that uh, the public understands that, uh, that the panther is not been previously animated, but she's doing in real time what she's feeling to do, whatever she's wanting to do. You know? So at any given moment that you enter the website of the stage or the museum, uh, in the case, um, the panther is, will be doing something different. And uh, completely it's also true that the panther is somehow trapped in a loop of uh, dream and, and awakening, in which uh, every few minutes, uh, a quarter or an hour approximately, the, the dream collapses and the, and the, the panther uh, wakes up again, but just to find herself in the same uh, landscape she was dreaming, she was walking through. So then she starts walking again, wandering again, until the dream collapses again. So it's like the dream inside the dream inside the dream inside the dream. I mean, the, the forest for me, it's, it, it's uh, the real forest, it's, it's somehow a model. You know? It's a model of, um, I would say a new cultural model, no? one that recognizes that uh, everything is entangled and everything is interdependent. And when you enter the, the, the rainforest and you see all this lushness no? and all this uh, amazing fertility and amazing uh, uh, amount of forms of life uh, living together, uh, it's a bit difficult to understand that actually the rainforest is a, it's a very poor place. No? It's a, uh, the, in terms of, of nutrients present, you know? uh, so inside the rainforest, uh, any given day, uh, the, the soil is, is mostly sandy. There's a huge lack of nitrogen in the soil, uh, and there's a there's a, a lack of water, even if it's a rainforest, because the canopy is so thick that the water almost doesn't reach the ground. And the same with the sun; you know? the sun also doesn't reach the, the Sun. So actually, many many species of plants that are there, especially the big trees, uh, are there waiting for a big tree to fall in order to start to germinate. It can be years in the ground waiting for the right moment. But the thing is that what makes the forest so so fertile and so and so lush and so rich is the the, the amount of uh, of metabolic interdependencies are uh, in between the species that compound the, the rainforest. This is also what makes the, the rainforest so, so fragile, no? because once you have broken these relationships, uh, because you are cutting the forest or whatever, it's extremely difficult to, 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 to you know, replant the, the rainforest, because you would need to build all these, uh, all these uh, metabolic interactions. You know? and, almost every species present and there's thousands and thousands has its parcel that uh, it's, uh, its piece. No? So um, this for me has become uh, a model and how, how a body of work should be created no? and how when you do a new piece brings a new light 
it's it's somehow illuminated by all the pieces that have been done before, but at the same time brings a new light to the to the also to the ones that uh, that uh, were done before it, and um, and also opens new paths uh, into this forest uh, for the for the future to come. So little by little, things are settling and are growing together and, and are enriching, enriching themselves. So, so um, right now, for example, if you know a little bit of my work and you know, are aware of Phantom and about, about how this uh, rainforest, this scan rainforest was used before, then uh, it's kind of difficult not to think that this, uh, this panther uh, that is now wandering uh, through the Thyssen Museum in Madrid is not somehow a spirit uh, herself. No? And also, I, I recall like one of interview, one interview of you where you were talking about how these animals no, affect you and how you affect them. And this is connected also what we you were saying, like there is no way of not interlinking. And to me, something that was really interesting is like how the digital, how new technologies could get or add a different layer or new layer to those practices. No, like we were talking about nature no, in this romanticized way of sometimes mm -hmm. dealing with it, but also like how we take it into the digital realm and to create like a truly entangled system of connections and relationships. I mean, for me, it's pretty clear that most of the problems we are facing today, um, the ecological ones that are probably the main problem we are suffering and going to suffer in the, in the next uh, decades, um, it's, uh, it's uh, fruit or it's uh, directly produced by these fictitious uh, separation in between men and nature that uh, modernist thought uh, has uh, developed, no? So you take from, from the Scartes uh, to the day of today, uh, there's been like a depuration and, a, and, a, um, and a not an evolution, but um, uh, an elaboration of this separation between the rest cogitans and the rest extents as, as the, if they were two separate things, no? So um, this is what, no? Looking uh, nature as something external to us uh, is what has allowed us to destroy nature without uh, perceiving we were destroying ourselves. <laughs> but as, as philosophy, uh, morals, or, or science uh, evolves, um, I think all these separations are getting blurred again, no? luckily. And um, I actually think that uh, art has a, has a very, very relevant uh, part in, in, in erasing these this clear boundaries or these clear separations in between men and nature. Technology also, no? so every, every new technology has changed the way we understand the, the world. No? So it was because Galileo Galilei invented the telescope that we realized that we were not the center of the universe. No? That was a huge uh, change. Uh, actually, it was we tried to bar him. No? <laughs> the, so the um, I guess virtual reality somehow it's a uh, it's a uh, it's also going to change. No, and all the, obviously all this digital. No, we are we have actually never met. No, but I, I have the clear feeling that I know you pretty well already. <laughs> so that's that. Yeah, the whole idea of presence is going to change a lot, you know? and I guess with the idea of presence, also the idea of belonging, you know, the idea of, uh, of to what you are entangled, to what you are attached. You know? And I think, um, I think we really should erase this idea of individualism. It's, a, it's such, a, such a capitalistic um, concept and also a right-wing one. <laughs> it's sometimes like the great excuse no, for development, progress, and these whole ideas that have been very much connected to also the transformation of the Amazonian forest, that all other natural resources and landscapes. So it's not only that. And one thing that I wanted to follow up on that is um, the idea of this entanglement and this 
kind of looking differently to things. I've uh, read many references to the Ameridian thought um, followed by Eduardo Ribeiro's Del Castro. And I mm -hmm. wanted to, to go a bit deeper into that. Also thinking that you manage or you work with many references that come from Brazil, that it's like your homeland, no? Or like your not homeland, like how do you say like, you're at home, <laughs> you're home <laughs> yes, you know, like kind of that there is a, but it's a process of learning, no? it's a process of approaching it, no, that it was not given to you since that it's something you encounter. I mean, I've read like through many exhibitions, I mean, mm -hmm. through your interest or dream of the Amazonian forest, but also through exhibitions at Tapis Foundation of Lilla Clark, Elio Tizica and other, all the artists. So how you, um, entangle that philosophy as well or that learning process that then we can go into the indigenous people and how you are also learning by from them no? and, and mm -hmm. relate to them in different ways. I, I wanted to be a biologist when I was a, a kid so from eight years old to 15 or so uh, I was sure I was going to be a biologist um, at some point I realized that I would never be good enough at the mathematical and chemistry part of it which are huge um, so so yeah then i decided to become an artist but obviously this passion for for the for nature and for biology in general uh, has never uh, has never abandoned me you know? and um and then when i was a young student uh, of art i, I was uh, extremely lucky of having Manolo Borja Villel at the Fundación Tapies that did a stream of shows that have been extremely influential to me until now. And very especially uh, Elio Tifica and Lisa Clark uh, shows. No? When maybe the, the show of, uh, of uh, Elio Tifica was a little bit too young when I saw it, but when I saw the, the Lisa Clark show, I was completely blown away by it, you no. Know? And I remember um, manipulating one of her beaches, you no, know, this little aluminum hinged aluminum sculpture that you can modify. And it, it's it's amazing because um, you can you can move them in several possible forms, you can you can you know hinge them in one direction in the other, but there's some a moment where where the, the sculpture resists, you know, the beach resists. The, the, the move when you want to do it kind of hits you back you know? and then I was like oh my god no I, I just realized it very clearly and very sharply that uh, I was transforming the sculpture but the sculpture was transforming me at the same time and this completely changed my understanding of what an art object is or can do and um, so yeah I started to research more about Ligia and, and then going back to, Il, to Elio and then from them to a lot of other uh, Brazilian artists uh, like Ligia Pape or Antonio Manuel or Silvio Meirelles or etc etc also the younger generations you know, like Ernesto Neto or Ivan Enoes Vander, Laura Lima I mean it's, it's so many so many uh, amazing artists that at some point I say okay I'm going to go to to Brazil and uh, gonna take the chance to visit finally the rainforest and then know more about this amazing artist. And I was supposed to come for three months and that was like 16 years ago already. So I never, never really come back. <laughs> but um, I mean, obviously one of the first things I did when I, when I arrived in Brazil uh, was to, to fly to the, to the Amazon and go there and start, uh, start uh, yeah, being there no, for, the, for the first time. And I remember so clearly uh, the feeling of, of, uh, of being in the middle of a mesh of, uh, of uh, sentient beings. So it's, it's so clear that you are not the only one, or not even the main one, uh, like for us Europeans, it's so easy to, to have this uh, entitled position in which you are, you know, like the master of the landscape or whatever. There you are, you're basically a food <laughs> for, for, uh, 
for for the mosquitoes at least. <laughs> so, and um, but it's it's so clear you are not alone at any any at any moment. You are, you are really in, in, in embedded in a in a mesh of uh, of life. I, I was like, uh, like, like if I had uh, like a super strong drug or something like that. No? So I never, I never had ayahuasca uh, myself. And it's uh, something super fancy right now, and this also makes me, you know, uh, hide a little bit from it because uh, I think it's such a powerful uh, technology that uh, remove it from from its origin, so its place of origin feels a little bit absurd. You know? But um, but I don't think it's even necessary. Uh, I talk it to the plants, I talk it to the trees, I talk it to the river. It's, uh, it's so clear that they talk to you all the time. You, you really don't need to have ayahuasca to, to have this feeling. Yeah. But um, another discovery that, uh, that I did uh, there in, the, in, the, uh, in Brazil when I arrived, there was something I didn't know about at all because I've never been an anthropology. Uh, until now, now I'm an anthropology fan. But uh, until now, uh, until then, I was I was uh, never read any uh, anthropological uh, ideas or, or anything, not even Levi Strauss. And um, so, one of the most amazing, amaz amazing things I discovered here in, in Brazil is all the all the all the mythologies and the medieval cosmologies you know, that are so incredibly rich. And uh, very especially through the work of Eduardo Viveros de Castro, which is an absolutely major uh, anthropologist, uh, incredibly influential, and incredibly uh, ambitious also you know, in, his, in, his, uh, in his thoughts. And he's proposing this idea of um, of a Merindian perspectivism. So basically, he, it's, it's like a, it's almost a pretty symmetrical inversion of many philosophical ideas uh, of, uh, of Occident. So he takes the, the, uh, the idea of perspectivism, you know, it's uh, been, I don't know, Nietzsche now has been a perspectivist uh, himself, uh, and then proposes what would be an Amerindian uh, perspectivism. You know? And, um, and basically, he realized that uh, for, for, um, for most uh, Amerindians, if not for all of them, there's, there's one thing that is pretty common to, to, the, to the Amerindian thought, that is the idea that humanity is the origin of everything. So for us, uh, we normally understood that uh, nature is the origin of everything. And then such a process of evolution or such a process of uh, cultural uh, education or whatever, we are separating from nature. Yeah? So if you take the world, world you will divide it in, in the living and the non-living. The living, you will divide in plants and animals. The animals, you will divide them in uh, superior and inferior animals. No? The, the superior vertebrate animals, you will. So you, you, keep, you keep slicing this world and to, to reach at the end this very thin slice, which is the, the, the only human uh, slice. No? So everything is natural and only this thin slice here is the, is the human. Um, for the Merindians, it's the opposite. Humanity is at the origin of everything. Everything is human. And um, so um, this doesn't mean that everything is a human being in the, in the sense, you know, like a biological uh, sense of the, of the world, but that humanity is at the origin. So in the mythological times, everything was human. And then through a process of myth and uh, through a process of evolution, uh, some humans lose their form or, for, or become trees, become clouds, become um, master spirits, or panthers, or, uh, or whatever. No? Um, and, and there's a lot of ideas uh, regarding this uh, Meridian perspectivism that are super complex, and, and I myself still uh, trying to understand. But basically, 
if everything is human, everything can be a subject. And if everything can be a subject, everything can have its own point of view of anything. No? So again, another inversion that happens is that uh, objects are not something, it's not like you are a subject and then everything that is in your point of view is, a, is an object, um, but that you are an object or a subject or a pot, or a, or a spirit, or whatever, depending on which point of view you are catch in a given moment. So you are very different if you are being watched by your child, by your enemy, by a panther, or by a spirit. You know? um, this has a lot of consequences. You now, um, for example, for us, um, for us Westerns, to understand something. Uh, we try to objectify the thing we try to understand. We even say what is something objectively, you know, uh, meaning what is something in itself without the influence of, of ourselves. Um, but the science has already proven that the, the, the viewer already affects the, the object observer. No? So I don't know, we still insist in this idea because we, are, we, we, we also have already proven to ourselves that this is wrong. But for the, for the uh, Amerindians, to understand something is to subjectify it. So to give it the most agency possible. So what, when a chaman is, uh, is uh, you know, talking to the, to the forest or talking to, to a rock or to, to a river, is understanding the amount of agency that this rock has in, in, in your life. No? So the, 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 the Western thought is always about the individuality, about the essence, about the, what are the things in themselves. And the Amerindian thought is about the relationship, the alliance, the otherness. You know? And um, this, this idea of not having objects and subjects in fixed positions, but relations of mutual transformation. For me, it's, 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 it's been incredibly inspiring because um, if you bring that to the, to the to a reign of the, of the art world, uh, if there's no subjects and objects in fixed positions anymore, but relations of mutual transformation, there's no uh, art works and viewers anymore. That's something that's very much present no? in all your practice, this idea of establishing a relationship and an object that transforms itself, creating like kind of different possibilities and different meanings and also different status of being throughout its life. It's, I mean, I think I mean, this is why I'm an artist <laughs> and not anything else, but uh, I think artist has uh, such a power to transform uh, very delicate, subtle, but uh, incredibly powerful and, uh, and, and almost definitive ways. No? Uh, and um, you can feel gigantic and looking at the land, you know, maybe you are looking at an artwork that is that size, but it's like a little landscape and then you become like a little teeny person that can walk through this uh, landscape and then suddenly you are gigantic and you are over a world world. And um, so you are changing in scale and space and time uh, very quickly and very fluidly through an exhibition. I think the, the exhibition itself as a medium is such a, such a rich platform. I'm always very surprised there's no more, more disciplines using the, 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 the medium of the exhibition for, for putting forward their ideas and their things. It's a way of, cre of creating spaces, no? spaces of encounter for encounter and that then connections can happen and trigger. And because I think also about dreaming panther and seeing it, I mean, seeing the relationship with the space that transforms it and creates a completely different space within the exhibition or within the museum itself. You know? So you get into or immerse into the, Forest, that's a beautiful moment, no? and how you become a voyeur of something that it's somewhere else or that recalls or reconnects with a phantom. And this idea also of the, um, the things that are where and maybe will be, it's, it's also interesting, no? like how time also affects, it's affected a lot by this idea 
I mean, going back to the idea of nature, that's one of the the part in or the um, the beginning, no, maybe of the podcast that it's presented together with uh, within this week in, on a stage that it's conducted by Elena Palmquist, and that departs from that that idea of humanity being part of the the whole construction no, of the Amazonian forest on how this romantic idea of really Western idea of wild nature doesn't mm -hmm. exist. So yes. if you could go a bit farther on that. Uh, yes, I mean, I hope that uh, that to whoever uh, gets to listen to the, the podcast, it will become really clear uh, a few facts. No? Uh, the first is that uh, Bolsonaro is a criminal and uh, is an eco and um, my idea is that it should uh, be judged by the AYA Tribunal of Human Rights. The only problem is that the ecocide is not a crime uh, still. Uh, some work is being done uh, about that. And I really hope he's one of the first ones to get judged about that. Uh, but um, the other um, thing that will become clear is that the, the, the rainforest itself, uh, the Amazon rainforest, that is uh, so commonly seen as this virginal uh, piece of uh, land uh, untouched by humans, it's actually anthropogenic. So the inhabitants of the, of the, of the Amazon basin for the last uh, thousands of years at least for the last 12,000 uh, years, have been modifying the forest to their, to their own interest. So what happened is that many of the plants that are useful for them in the Amazon, because not only for food, but also for fibers or for medicinals or things like that, are plants of a, of a really slow and really long, uh, really long uh, growth. So for example, a castaneira, it's a, it's a tree that uh, it, it takes 20 years to, to start making fruits and also needs all the trees around it to, to be fertile, you know, to be pollinized and everything. So you cannot make a field of castaneiras. It will become uh, um, uh, infertile and will not produce any fruit. And, um, and also who, who is gonna plant uh, you know, a field of castaneiras and, and then wait 20 years for it to start giving fruits. So what, what, what they have been doing for the last uh, thousands of years is you know, planting castaneiras along the forest. So they knew there would be uh, castañas available. No? And, and who says castaneiras says acai, says many things. Actually, if you take the 10 plants that are more present uh, all over the Amazon, nine are plants that are useful for humans. So, so that's pretty clear that it's been like, a, like an intervention. Uh, uh, but the amazing thing of uh, that is that uh, they manage not only to not destroy the Amazon, uh, the rainforest, but to enrich it. Because the more fruits they were, the more animals they were. So if you look the areas with more biodiversity in the Amazon are the areas that have been occupied by humans for the longer time. So there's been a process of co-constitution in between the humans that live there and the, and the forest that has been uh, created. And, um, and the animals, uh, so the, the whole bioma, no? it's been, it's been um, I mean, it is very ambitious to say the humans created the bioma. The bioma created the humans as well. No? So it's, like it's, it's been a, really a, a co-foundation. Uh, co uh, is this a entanglement? You know, we were saying before, like, I mean, in the end, it's not so easy to separate it. And as part of these um, humans and this presence, it's also the indigenous people no, that are kind of taking care. And there are like many voices represented on the podcast. And I think that's also really important, not only in your practice, but on your life and as a person, you know, the commitment towards their way of being also will be present on the call to action. Like we have, or we are inviting a peep, I mean, people to support a peep, that it's one of the movements of the indigenous people. So, I mean, how you, 
connect to that and how it's that connects to you no how affects you and you affect that in a way as i was saying i've been i've been really interested in, in the amerindian thought uh, and it's been one of the major influences uh, of my own practice no? but uh, it's been really uh, since uh, the end of 2015 uh, i guess it was when Dilma uh, approved uh, under the pressure of the um, of the uh, big part of the Congress uh, approved the new Código Forestal, no? the new Forest Code, uh, which legalized uh, all the uh, deforestation that was already done in Brazil, but also established uh, a way in which uh, the forest can be uh, deforested in the future. Um, this, this, uh, this criminal uh, law uh, of the forest um, actually multiply by four uh, from one year to the other uh, the deforestation in Brazil. I think that was the very first moment I got triggered uh, to, to do something myself uh, to try to protect the rainforest. And I've been, I've been thinking since uh, a bit. But the Bolsonaro just, just uh, made that uh, so if it was bad uh, now, now it's incredibly bad. No? So now they are under attack uh, every single day. Um, the government has already proven that they will do nothing to punish the invasors of land. Um, there's many, many invasions of land to put cows, to put the wood out, to, to mining and get the gold uh, out. The mining is especially bad because they are polluting with mercury. All the rivers are killing all the fauna in the river and also obviously killing the Indians that are obliged to drink this polluted uh, with mercury water. Um, and the government has uh, again and again shown that uh, they will not uh, prosecute or do anything to prevent this to happen. And um, for me, it also become clear that uh, the best way to protect the, the forest is to protect the people that live in the forest, uh, the indigenous and the traditional populations. And uh, from all the people around, uh, there's amazing uh, organizations like the Instituto Social Ambiental, or Amazon Watch, or even Greenpeace is also doing amazing work uh, in, the, in the Amazon and in other rainforests. But uh, APIP is the, um, is the Association dos Povos Indígenas de Brazil. Uh, it's a huge organization that involves uh, six or seven uh, of other uh, smaller organizations. And they are, they are really uh, into day to day uh, of the Congress, doing pressure, doing pressure in the judiciary, uh, doing pressure uh, on the land, uh, doing demonstrations of fighting away the, the invasors. And, um, and yeah, this is how I choose uh, them for the, for the call for action, for the rest, because they are really like the guerrilla of the guerrillas. Mm -hmm.